Welcome, they call me Tolum Bay and I will be your guide to the history of Kumans. I will be also calling them Polovci, as it is the name in which they were known in Eastern Slavic languages. Now, let me present to you the interaction with the lands of the Kievan Rus, in this case mostly the principalities of Kiev, Chernigov and Pereyaslav, laying in the northern part of today's Ukraine. As all the other nomadic migrations, it started with the turmoil in the steppes of Central Asia. The origin of these people we call Kumans or Kipchaks or Polovci or many other names is a foggy issue, that I won't go into details right now. What is important to know is that the steppes north of the Black Sea were in the 10th century ruled by another Turkic nomadic tribe, the Pecheniks. Disturbances in the southern Siberia started the domino effect. Kumans pushed on August Turks, which pushed on Pecheniks. Pecheniks were forced to move more and more towards the Danube, eventually crossing it and entering the domain of the Byzantine Emperor in 1040s. August or Uzis, still under the pressure of the Kumans, found the same fate beyond the Danube some 20 years later. Smaller groups of Pecheniks and Uzis that didn't run from the steppe were either scattered on the border of the Rus, employed by the sedentary powers, or were subjugated and assimilated by the Polozzi. To gather the essence of the very complicated issue of Kuman Rus relationship, one must understand how the political system of Kievan Rus worked. To put it very simply, it wasn't the unified empire, but the loose union of princedoms, each ruled from a central eponymous city. Highest of the princes resided in Kiev and had the titular power over the other principalities. During our time, starting from the second half of the 11th century, real strength of the Grand Prince's rule depended on his personal prowess in politics, diplomacy and of course warfare. The slow disintegration started when the skilled ruler, Yaroslav the Wise, died in 1054 and the power in the three strongest southern principalities were divided in a so-called triumvirate of his sons. Izyaslav ruled first as Grand Prince of Kiev, Sviatoslav in Chernihiv and Vsevolod in Pereyaslav. At the beginning, the sons followed their father's instruction and formed a strong alliance, but not for long, as we will see very soon. The very first mention of the Polozzi in the Rus chronicles comes from the year 1054 to 1055, right after the mention about the Prince of Pereyaslav Vsevolod defeating the August Turks in his domain during the winter. The Polovci advanced under the leadership of certain Bolush, but made peace with Vsevolod without the fight. Some historians assume that the vanquished Turks were subjects of Bolush and the prepared attack was retaliatory. In my opinion, more probable explanation is that they were the opposite of the formal subjects, a tribe pushed by the Kumans from their pastures and pursued towards the west. As they were already scattered by the Rus prince, there was no reason to continue the campaign so they could have made peace surely followed by some kind of gifts to uphold it and throw it back. First real Polovcian attack came seven years later, probably from the same direction as they clashed again with Vsevolod of Pereyaslav. Instead of Bolush, they were led by certain Iskal. Main goal of this raid was looting, possibly connected with testing out the enemy, since according to the Chronicle, right after they defeated Vsevolod, they retired back to their pastures laden with loot. Situation repeated in the year 1068, when the true metal of the triumvirate of Jaroslav's son was put to test. Kumans obviously came with stronger force, as the brothers needed to unite their armies, marched against them up to River Alta, in the very vicinity of the city of Pereyaslav itself. They made with Kumans in the dead of night, but were defeated and the princes had to run for their lives. Sviatoslav fled to Chernihiv and Izyaslav and Sevolod to Kiev. But after brief struggle with the locals, they had to run even from there. Throne of the Grand Prince was usurped by their distant relative Seslau, freshly released from the prison. Swarms of Kumans spread around the lines of Rus and no one dared to try to stop them. At first. When the looting went too close to Chernihiv, Sviatoslav had to act and approach them with a the small retinue he collected in the city. Literary sources says that Sviatoslav's suicide squad only contained 3000 men against the Kumans 12,000 but the men of Chernihiv prevailed. Polovci were defeated nearby the small town called Snowsk and their leader was captured on November the 1st. Primary Chronicle doesn't name the Prince of the Kumans, however, the first Novgorod Chronicle says it was Sharuhan, a very important person we will meet later in our story. It is also hard to say how much the Chronicle exaggerates the deeds of Sviatoslav against the Pagan hordes that were according to the author sent by the god as a punishment on Rus. It is possible that Sviatoslav defeated some smaller part of the horde and Kuman numbers were blown up to show the Christian ruler, which short time ago had to run away for his own life, in a better light. Other point of view can be that the capture of their prince, 
whether it was really Shah Rukh Khan or not, by the much smaller force of the Rus warriors, impressed the Polovci very much. Later, we will see their quite cordial relations with Sviatoslav's sons. The release of their leader could also have been one of the conditions of the Kuman's head for leaving the Principality and not to return, at least for some time. Next Kuman raid is recorded in 1071, but we don't know much more than a short notice in the Primary Chronicle. The Polovtsians raided about Rastovets and Neyatin, which are cities southwest of Kiev. The direction of the attack may show that the Kumans already secured their position west of the river Dnepr, a fact that many historians argue happened only much later. Soon after that, the situation in Rus dramatically changed. Triumvirate fell apart as Sviatoslav and Sevolod joined their forces and expelled Izyaslav from Kiev, forcing him to run away. Sviatoslav, named as the main perpetrator of this strife, sat on the Grand Prince's throne, but died after a short time due to an illness. Izyaslav returned, but the relationship with the third brother, Sevolod, was already damaged. Even though the strifes between brothers, uncles, nephews and cousins were a very common occasion in Rus, this one is closely connected with the Kumans. The land of Chernihiv, ruled originally by Sviatoslav, included a dispatched enclave sitting on the Kerch Strait dividing Black and Azov seas called Tmutoraka. This region, divided from the rest of the Rus by a wide strip of the steppe, was in the vicinity of Byzantine colonies in Crimea and the former Khazaria. After Sviatoslav's usurpation of the throne and his sudden death, Tmutarakan served as a refugium of his sons Oleg and Roman, while the throne of Chernihiv was taken by Vsevolod. Using the proximity of the steppe and contacts that the nomads had with the rich merchant hubs of Tmutarakan, Oleg persuaded Kumans to join him in the attempt to seize Chernihiv. Vsevolod marched against them as far as river Sojica, north of the Chernihiv, which means that they were already pillaging the unfortified countryside. Kumans and their allies won the battle, Sevolod fled to Kiev to ask his brother for help and Oleg took his father's throne in Chernihiv. He wasn't sitting on it for very long though. Sevolod, gathering reinforcements from Grand Prince Izyaslav, returned and after the battle of the Nezhin fields, he found himself in a very good position. Oleg's forces were defeated and he himself was forced to flee, while Izyaslav was killed in battle, leaving the position of Grand Prince vacant and ready for his younger brother. Indeed, a win-win situation for Vsevolod, as he became practically the sole ruler of most of the Rus. And very bad news for sons of Sviatoslav Jaroslavich. In the next year of 1079 came turn for next Sviatoslav's son Roman to try to take over their father's land. Also residing at Mutarakan, Roman used Oleg's strategy and hired a host of Kumans for his campaign. However, he didn't take into account Vsevolod's cunning. The last remaining son of Yaroslav the Wise didn't bear a reputation of a great warrior and general. He got defeated or routed by the Polozzi a couple of times earlier, but we shouldn't forget that it was Vsevolod who encountered Kumans at the first Rus prince some 25 years earlier and was able to appease them and make them leave without fight. He once again used the same strategy to avoid the fighting. Instead, he made an agreement with Polovci, who once again turned back to their steps taking Roman with them. On top of that, Roma never got back to Tmutarakan. During their journey, Kumans, certainly bribed by Sevolot, killed the young prince and let his bones rot in the sea of grass. Polovci didn't attack Rus principalities for more than a decade. We know only about some stirring of August Turks residing in the Pereaslav trying to attack their Rus benefactor, but were decidedly crushed by Sevolot's son, Vladimir Monomach. In the year 1082, Chronicler just vaguely mentions that prince of Polovcians named Osen passed away. We don't know neither the circumstances of his death nor the exact role he played in the Kuman Rus relations during his lifetime. He was surely an important person in the steppe, being father of Aepa, who will be playing a pivotal role in the consequent decades. In the year 1092, the Polovci returned to Rus with great splendor. While the chronicler speaks about various bad signs, drought, forest fires, and invisible demons killing people in the streets, perhaps some kind of epidemic. The Kuman horde was again reported from all quarters of Rus. They even took over three cities, Pesochen, Perevolok and Priluk, in the Pereaslav Principality. They also allied with the founder of Halician Principality Vasil Korostislavic in a tag on Poland. After looting and pillaging, they most probably returned to their camps. No resistance against them is recorded. Next stage of Kuman Rus contacts came when Sevolot, last of the Triumvirate, died in 1093. Polovci, 
about to attack the Rus found out about his death and sent envoys to the new Grand Prince, Sviatopolk, son of Izyaslav, requesting peace, most probably connected with Rus paying them high tribute to return to their pastures. Sviatopolk, coming from the northernmost principality of Novgorod, not having much experiences with the nomads, didn't listen to the Kievan councillors, but relied only on the people he brought with him and seized the envoys and threw them in prison. Outraged Kumans focused their full force on the principality of Kiev and sieged the city of Torchesk, center of the August Turks, who were used as a border guards in the buffer zone of the Rus princes against their invading cousins. Obviously scared Sviatopolk released the envoys, but too late. Kumans didn't plan to go anywhere without loot. Grand Prince of Kiev thus began to gather the men able to fight the nomads, collecting 800 warriors. Luckily, after the initial stubbornness, he decided to listen to the men of Kiev that explained to him not even 10 times more soldiers will help and that he has to call for aid of his cousins from the neighboring principalities. Messengers reached Vladimir Monomach in Chernihiv and Rostislav in Pereyaslav, both sons of late Grand Prince Vsevolod. Three princes formed an alliance and marched towards the Kumans that spread around the land. Reaching the river Stugna, not far south from Kiev, Rus forces stopped for a war council. Cautious Vladimir advised to stay on the left bank and rather make peace with the Polovci, but the men of Kiev, eager to fight, overruled him. Rus' army crossed the swollen river, passed around the town of Trepol and reached its outer ramparts, where the main battle took place. Rus' princes organized their men traditionally in three columns, with Rostislav in the center, Sviatopolk on the right wing and Vladimir on the left, positioning the infantry and horsemen between the earthen fortifications and sending the archers in front of it. Kumans used this situation, crushed the bowmen, climbed the rampart and first focused their attack on Sviatopolk's wing. Prince himself is described as taking a firm stand, but his men routed without fighting, forced him to flee also. Getting third of the enemies out of the picture, Kumans moved for the left wing, marshaled by Vladimir. Meeting resistance, they managed to crush it and forced both Vladimir and Rastislav to flee. Reaching river Stugna, Rostislav drowned in attempts to swim across it and only Vladimir and handful of his men survived. They crossed Dnieper later on and returned to Chernihiv, while Sviatopol, after a brief stop in Trevovl, ran back to Kiev. In celebration of their victory, Polovci scattered upon marauding expeditions throughout the countryside and part of them returned to siege Torchesk. This battle took place on 26th day of May. Now, I will need to explain how this siege looked like. Unlike the Mongols that came a century and a half later to siege the Rus cities, Kumans didn't possess siege engines to hurl destruction on the earth and wooden fortifications. Instead, the siege comprised of nomad armies setting up a camp in front of the city, trying to cut out all the entry roads. As we see in the sources, usually the cities were not even under full blockade, as the chronicler often mentioned sending pleas for help by messengers and sometimes even reinforcements entering the siege cities. The same situation we can see in this instance. People of Torchesk were able to defend the attacks on the city walls, but couldn't hold without the food supplies. Polovci also cut off the water entering the city, making the inhabitants not only hungry, but now also thirsty. They sent requests for aid to Sviatopolk. Supplies were dispatched, but could not reach the town. At this point, the siege was going on for nine weeks, when part of the Kumans moved from Torchesk, raiding towards Kiev. Sviatopolk was once again compelled to march against them and once again he failed in the battle near Jalan. Nestor's chronicle describes losses even bigger than those at Stugna River. People of Torchesk lost all hope and surrendered. Polovci burned down the whole town and taken the inhabitants as captives into the steppes. Next year, 1094, Sviatopolk probably realized what grave mistake he made in underestimating the Kumans and made peace with their leaders. In addition, he married daughter of important Khan, Tugor Khan. The same person leading the raids into the Balkans which I mentioned in the earlier videos. But during the same year, the old troublemaker Oleg returned to the scene. His life story may be a separate topic for a novel. After we left him defeated and running for his life after second attempt to take Chernihiv with Kuman mercenaries, he was captured, imprisoned by the Byzantine Emperor and sent to exile on the island of Rhodes. Even though his position wasn't that bad, as he got married with influential Byzantine noblewoman who bore him numerous children, with whom we will meet later. 
By the year 1094, he was back at Muktarakani and with the motto, third time is the charm, he hired Kumans and marched to his father's domain in Chernihiv. Vladimir, who was ruling the city, fortified himself only to watch as the Kumans are burning the suburban areas and monasteries. Probably an impossible situation to win by force and being on the wrong side of the traditional law, Vladimir ceded Chernigov to Oleg, who finally was able to take his heritage and rule the city until his death some 20 years later. Polovci, laden with loot and captives, returned to their pastures and Vladimir took residence in Pereyaslav, position vacant after his brother Rostislav drowned in Stugna. Here I will pause the story, as the Menji Bonyak is preparing to strike on Kyiv and Vladimir Monomach is preparing to take over the title of Grand Prince. So, next time you will hear the beat of the horse's hooves, you will know who is coming. Thank you for watching.